Okay. So yeah, so this is uh, day two. So we're you know planning on proving Poincaré duality uh, via the you know or this, what I'm calling space level Poincaré duality, and uh, half of that is finding a space whose homotopy groups agree with homology. Um, yeah, so the, the plan for today is we'll have a, a quick review, and then I'll uh, talk about the eilenberg steenrod axioms, which are, um, some of you have seen, like, I believe, is it true that, like, when Ralph teaches 572, he, he proves the Eilenberg, or he talks about eilenberg steenrod axioms? Yeah. Uh, he mentioned them at least, yes. Okay, yeah. I think I didn't do it when I taught 572, but no one here took that for me. Uh, yeah, I, I'll review what they are, and uh, if someone wants a proof, I can like add that to some lecture at some point. Um, and then, you know, the eilenberg rod axioms are, I think, five axioms that say, like, if you have some functors that satisfy these conditions, then the functors agree with homology. Um, and we're going to check all but the hardest one today, the hardest one in order to check um, you know, involves the notion of vibrations. So the plan for next week is just to have sort of a review of um, algebraic topology or slash a crash course in algebraic topology. Um, so like, I think next Tuesday, I'm gonna talk about homotopy groups. And then on Thursday, I'll talk about vibrations. And then the following week, we'll get back to proving the gold Tom Kahn theorem. And then um, the final topic for today, which hopefully I won't have time for is generalized homology theories. This is like, mostly designed for filler in case things go way too fast and it's just sort of like general knowledge and I'm not going to go into that much detail um, if I have time. Great. Any questions before we begin? Okay. So, uh, you know, Z of X will denote the free abelian group on a, a space X. And uh, you know, X will come with a topology, and that will give a induce a topology on on, Z, on the free abelian group. You know, one way of seeing that is just look at the uh, there's a surjective map from like disjoint unions of products of Z to the n and X to the n, and um, you know, so you can topologize the free abelian group with a quotient topology. And you know, the way I like to think about it is you have points in um, in your space X and they're each labeled by an integer and they're allowed to collide and then you add their, their labels. And so the, uh, the thing I'm calling the dold tom Kahn theorem, so for people who showed up earlier, Manuel and I have a discussion of what the like actual dold tom theorem and the actual dold Kahn theorem say, and this is sort of a little bit in between two of them. Um, uh, so yeah, so the theorem in the relative version, which implies the absolute version, is the statement that the homotopy groups of uh, space mod, sorry, so homotopy groups of the free abelian group on a space X modulo the free abelian group on a subspace Y, uh, that's the same thing as the relative homology groups. And the way at least I like to think about uh, free abelian group on a space modulo uh, the free abelian group on a subspace is you think of it as points moving around in the space, but when they hit the subspace, they they vanish. Great. Okay. So, um, you know, a vague statement of the eilenberg steenrod theorem is that up to isomorphism, relative homology is the unique way of assigning pairs of spaces of abelian groups. Um, and this doesn't seem grammatical, whatever. Uh, Abelian groups that satisfies a, a few basic properties. So, you know, I'm going to, in the next, whatever, 10 minutes, list some basic properties of homology, and then we're going to, then the theorem is going to be any functor that satisfies these basic properties, any collection of functors and natural transformations that satisfy these basic properties is going to agree with homology. And then the way we're going to prove, uh, you know, relative dole, the relative dole Tom theorem 
is we're going to look at the functor that sends a pair of spaces to the homotopy groups of uh, a free abelian group on one mod the free abelian group on the other and check that that functor satisfies the um, eilenberg steenrod axioms and, and hence that this thing is, um, you know, which will then prove the theorem. Any questions about the, the strategy? Okay. So, yeah, so the, here are properties of, of homology. So homology is a, a homotopy functor. So if you have um, uh, two maps of pairs that are, are homotopic, so meaning we have functions uh, f and g from x to x prime, and it sends y to y prime. Um, and you know if they're homotopic via a homotopy that um, uh, is also a map of pairs, so that you know the homotopy at each time sends y to a into y prime. Um, you know, if you have such a homotopy, then uh, uh, the two induced maps on relative homology agree. Hopefully, this is true. You know, as like, oh no, you want things to be fixed on y or something. Like, I totally could have made a mistake like that. But, you know, feel free to call me out on things like that. Um, and you know, this implies in particular that if you have uh, homotopy equivalents of pairs, then the homology groups are, are the same. So like the statement on morphisms implies the statement on, on objects. Okay, and the next property is it satisfies excision. So if, um, if U is contained in the, if the closure of U is contained in the interior of Y, so here I guess I should have written it out. Um, U is contained in Y, y is contained in x, then the induced map from x minus u rel y minus u into x rel y it induces a, an isomorphism on homology. Um, yeah, and then there's this thing called the dimension axiom, which is maybe a, I view as like a weird historical name. Um, I don't know, M maybe someone wants to give a speech on why it's a good name, feel free to interrupt me and do that. But you know, this just says that the homology of a point rel the empty set uh, is z in degree zero and zero otherwise. And you know, you remember relative homology of a space rel the empty set is the same thing as absolute homology. Um, yeah, and like if someone wants to just like say, hey, I don't remember what relative homology is or something like that, I'm, I'm open to comments like that also, or questions like that. Um, yeah, and feel free to just interrupt and yell, yo, Jeremy, whatever. Okay, uh, the next basic property is that the homology of a disjoint union is the direct sum of the homologies of the individual spaces. Um, and then the last property is you have a, a long exact sequence. Um, so, you know, if Y is a subspace of X, there's a map from homology of Y to the homology of X. And then um, there's a map from the homology, you know, you can homology of X, the same thing as homology of X rel empty set. There's a map from empty set to Y. So, you know, we get a map from homology of X to homology of X rel Y. And then there's this connecting homomorphism delta. And uh, the way you should think about it is, so the homology of X rel Y is generated by um, maps from an I simplex. Let's say the singular homology is generated by um, uh, right is not completely true. I guess it's generated by, I should have written chains. Or I should have been slightly more nuanced. Chains is generated um, by maps from an I simplex into X uh, that send the boundary of um, 
uh, the boundary of the simplex to y. And the boundary of the simplex is just a union of several different copies of um, i minus 1 simplices. I guess it's a union of i plus 1 i minus 1 simplices, right? Because when i is 1, delta i is an interval. And the boundary is uh, two points, which is two zero simplices. Um, yeah, so in this, this boundary operator that goes from i relative homology to i minus 1 homology of y is, you know, morally it's just a restriction of tau to the boundary. Here, you know, you view the boundary as i plus 1 different. Um, you know, this is like the union of. I plus one uh, copies of delta I minus one. Um, yeah. Okay. And... Hey, Jeremy. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I remember having kind of a geometric picture in my in my mind um, about um exition, but right now I can't quite recall it. Would you mind uh, telling me? What yeah, I mean, I could try. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, um, okay, well, you know, I'll, I'll prove it in the you know this complicated case for the you know this free abelian group thing. But what you uh, yeah, so what you should think of it as it's um, you know it's it's chains in X. You know, homology is generated. I'll draw a picture. Okay. X will be blue. X. Got Y. And inside Y is um you I should probably get like a stylus because I do have a touch screen uh, okay so you know what you should think of relative homology is generated by cycles that um, you know is generated by things that aren't cycles but their, their boundaries happen to land in um, in Y and what this is saying is uh, this is terrible. But, okay, let's say your relative your you let's say you have some relative cycle that um Uh, like the one where my cur you can see my cursor, right? Or is it not visible? I don't we know. can see your cursor. Yes. 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 Can so it. you look at this this relative cycle, and you're like, "Hey, this relative cycle goes into U." Well, what, what you you can do is after subdivision, you can say this relative cycle is equivalent to something. Um. I mean, morally, what you're what you prove is this relative cycle is homotopic to like um, one that doesn't go into you. Um, or, okay, actually, here's a better geometric way of thinking about it. So, let me a better picture. Uh, or here, here's a fact that like a relative homology of X rel Y is is isomorphic to reduced homology of the quotient in good circumstances. Oops. Forgot what I was writing. Right? And the um, x modulo y will be the same as x minus um x minus u modulo y minus u yep so 
uh, you know, this quotient space, you know, yeah, so I'm saying like X modulo Y is just going to be homeomorphic to X minus U modulo Y minus U under these conditions. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, okay, I get it. So, so basically, um, under nice conditions, if I'm taking relative homology X rel Y, yeah. then whatever happens inside Y in some U um, is kind of not, not relevant. Yeah, because what, what you should do, you know, um, yeah, because like, what we're, you know, an X mod Y is you just collapse all of Y down to a point. Mm -hmm. And the part in U is already in Y. So that's already being collapsed. Yeah, being collapsed, yep. yep. It's already being collapsed, so you didn't need yes. to add it into X. Uh, and then, you know, uh, but, you know, you could get into sort of, um, you, you definitely need the condition, these point set topological conditions, because let's say X is a disk and Y is the boundary sphere, and then you take U to be the boundary sphere also. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then, like, homology of a disk rel is sphere, rel is boundary sphere is the homology of a sphere. So, it, you know, it's non-trivial in, uh, in top degree. On the other hand, if you take, you know, X minus Y, you know, that's the interior of the disk. And mm -hmm. Y minus U in that case would be empty. So then you just get the homology of the disk. Yeah. And, you know, so that shows you do need some point set topological mm -hmm. assumptions. Like you can't, uh, I mean, basically it's saying don't throw out the part of Y that like, touches X. Okay, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Um, yeah, as if I, you know, I would rather this be boring for older grad students than lose half of the class immediately. Okay. Um, oh yeah, okay, so, um, so we want to state the Allenberg Steenrod axioms, which say that like any collection of functors that, that look like homology, you know, in fact, are just isomorphic homology. So what's sort of the categorical setup? So I'll let like um, ab denote the category of abelian groups with homomorphisms as morphisms. Top will be the category of topological spaces and continuous maps. P top will stand for like pairs of topological spaces. So the you know um, homomorphisms will just be continuous maps from x to x prime that send y to y prime. The homomorphisms will be the set of you know, the hom spaces. The hom sets will be those sets, and um, and then we're going to need two functors. So one of them is a forgetful functor that just remembers the second slot, um, and then we'll need this. Um, uh, empty set functor that sends a space to the pair space comma empty set. And, um, you know, the, in, in functor language, uh, so we're saying that HI is a functor, you know, maybe relative homology is a functor from pairs of topological spaces to abelian groups. Um, and then there's this complicated statement that says that the connecting homomorphism is a functor from, um, is, sorry, the connecting homomorphism is a natural transformation from the functor HI to the functor HI minus one composed with E composed with F. Someone can tell me that like I wrote them in the wrong order or that like F should be forget the other slot. Um, but ba basically, you know, because uh, the connecting homomorphism gives you a map of abelian groups from the i -th homology of x rel y to there's a typo. Um, this should be i minus one. Um, I minus one. I like red. Or next time it'll be red.
uh, yeah, so like if you look at this functor f followed by e followed by h i minus one, what does that do? It sends I think this is right um a pair of spaces to the homo uh sends a pair x y to the homology of y rel empty set, which is just the homology of y. So the statement that this is a natural transformation just means you have this connecting homomorphism and it makes a bunch of diagrams commute. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, the eilenberg steenrod axioms uh, are the following. So, you know, if you have a collection of functors from pairs of topological spaces to abelian groups, and we're, you know, we're gonna ask when are these functors just relative homology, and we have natural transformations, uh, you know, that are, we're gonna ask like, when are those the connecting homomorphisms? Um, so they, these functors and natural transformations satisfy the eilenberg steenrod axioms. If the functors are homotopy functors, if they satisfy excision, um, you know, if they satisfy a version of the dimension axiom, so they send point comma empty set to Z in degree zero and zero otherwise. Uh, if they send disjoint unions to direct sums, and if um, they have long exact sequences. So, you know, these are all properties that the relative homology and connecting homomorphism satisfy. Um, and so we say that, you know, functor, a collection of functors and natural transformations satisfy the eilenberg steenrod axioms if they just satisfy these five conditions. And then the theorem is um, that um, you know, that if you have a um, collection of functors and natural transformations that satisfy the eilenberg steenrod axioms, then your functors have to just be homology. Um, so this is a way of checking that something is homology. And, the, you know, the, this theorem is not that that hard. I mean, let's, for the moment, just restrict ourselves to CW complexes. How would you prove it? Well, okay, it's true for a point. Well, by the direct sum axiom, it's true for two points. Well, two points is S0. Um, it's a homotopy functor, so it's true for, for uh, disks. Now you look at, like, a, a one disk uh, with boundary two points. Well, whatever you know. You look at the long exact sequence, and then you now you you know the the, the answer for S one, and then you you know keep going, and etc. Um, if someone like asks me or emails me and tells me, I'm happy to. Give a proof of this. Uh, I haven't prepped it, so I'm not gonna give a proof now. Um, but it, you know, it's not that hard. You know, it's kind of like if you know how to prove like singular homology and simplicial homology agree. You know, it's a similar idea. You just sort of prove it in simple examples, and then they have the same properties and five lemma, um, etc. Are there any naturality conditions on that theorem? Um. Probably. And I guess, like, the next thing you'd probably want to add is TI also agrees with the connecting homomorphism. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it should... Um, like presumably... Um, like, there... there up to probably multiplication by sign, like this, the identification should be unique. Okay. Um, yeah, right, you know. Um, probably there's like a global automorphism by multiplication by negative one in the category of abelian groups or something. But like other than that, uh, it's probably unique. I'm. Some people are always like, oh, what you want is these two categories are equivalent. And I'm always like, oh, no, I just like, tell me what the statement says about objects. And you sort of you usually want both. 
But some people are just like, these two categories are equivalent and they don't even say what the equivalence is. And often to me, that's like more interesting because it gives you a statement about objects. So uh, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, definitely. Or, you know, I'm pretty sure one can just make this as, uh, as natural as you want. Okay, so our proof strategy for the proving the dual um, con theorem is to just check that um, uh, you know this functor that's going to be pi i of um, you know that's going to send a pair of spaces to homotopy groups of free abelian group on X modulo free abelian group on Y satisfies the um, the Eilenberg uh, Steenrod axioms. Uh, oops, the some other version. We're we're only going to check it for CW complexes, um, and then you know, then we'll only get the theorem for CW complexes. But yeah, that's fine. Um, oh yeah, and so the what the connecting homomorphism is is you know if you know what a vibration is, um, great. Hopefully this will make sense. If you don't know what a vibration is, hopefully in um, uh, you know, two week or a, a week plus an hour from now, you will know what a vibration is. Um, and then, you know, I'll, we'll revisit it. But so, you know, the um, uh, vibration is a kind of map that has the property that um, uh, you know, it's a map from E to B and the property that if you take the pre image of a point, you get a long exact sequence in homotopy groups with uh, the fiber of the map. Uh, the domain of the map, the codomain of the map, et cetera. Um, and so what we're going to prove is we're going to prove that the map from the uh, free abelian group on X to the free abelian group on X mod Y is a vibration, and the pre-image of points is going to be a free abelian group on Y, and this will, um, this will immediately check axiom 5, and we'll define the connecting homomorphism. Um, you know, but we'll, we'll do this... Uh, in, in two weeks once we've, or a week and a half from now, once we've talked more about what vibrations are. Uh, oh yeah, and there's an asterisk around vibration. Um, so in the case of the dulled, um, the original dulled Tom theorem, which involves monoids, the map is not a vibration, it's something called a quasi-vibration. And um, I have a reference that proves that this map is a quasi-fibration. Quasi-fibrations also have long exact sequences of homotopy groups. I think this map is actually a fibration. I asked math overflow and no one, no one answered my question. I got like only four like or four upvotes. So, um, so you know, I'll try to prove it. If you don't believe my proof, I'll, um, I'll prove it's a quasi-fibration. Uh, but I think I think it's a vibration. Um, yeah, well, yeah, we'll see. So that's what the asterisk means. Uh, any questions? Okay, yeah. So the plan for the rest of the day is to check uh, everything other than the the long exact sequence axiom, um, and then depending on how much time we have left, maybe story time about um, spectra and generalized homology theories. Okay, so we need to check the homotopy axiom. Um, so we need to check that if you have um, two maps of pairs that are homotopic, then the, um, I guess on these slides, I should have written what we're trying to check. We're, tr we're trying to check here that, um, you know, the functor sending a pair to pi i of the free abelian group on x mod y is a, a, a homotopy functor. Um, and so, you know, what that boils down to is the fact that homotopy groups are a homotopy functor. And uh, if you have a, a map of, of, if you have a homotopy between two maps of pairs, you can apply the free abelian group functor to that homotopy in the obvious way. And you'll get a homotopy between the Induced maps. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, 
I think this one is relatively straightforward. Um, feel free to, you know, either say, like, I don't believe what you're saying, or, like, I forgot what you're trying to prove because you didn't write it on the slide. Or some other question. Okay, so the, the next thing we're going to talk about is is uh, excision, and yeah. You know, um, so to, again, I sort of wrote a proof, sketch of a proof of something that we're that didn't write the statement. So the, you know the the claim is just that if you take the um, three abelian group on that's a typo. Uh, just the U shouldn't be there. U shouldn't be there. Uh, the free abelian group on X minus U, rel the free abelian group on Y minus U, then um, that's just homeomorphic to the free abelian group on X um, modulo free abelian group on Y. Yeah, when we picture like X is. A cylinder y is half of a cylinder and u is one end of the cylinder so you know you should think of it as configurations of points in x that aren't in y and they vanish if they enter um enter y well that's the same as points in x that aren't in u that vanish if they enter y not u um so, you know, because these spaces are homeomorphic, they have isomorphic homotopy group, which is, um, which is checking that, uh, you know, which checks that this functor satisfies the excision axiom. Okay, oh, yeah, just some remark about excision. So we sort of talked about this a little earlier, but, you know, you definitely need these point set topological assumptions. So, um, so let's just assume like u is y. Um, if u is y, then the free abelian group on x minus u modulo y minus u, well, u is y, so this is the empty set, so you just get the free abelian group on x minus y. Um, and that's, there's, there's a natural bijection from that to the free abelian group on X um, modulo free abelian group on Y, but they definitely have different topologies. So in the, you know, in, take a picture where X is the cylinder and Y is the end of a cylinder, free abelian group on X modulo Y. If, if you take a sequence of points where this point labeled by six walks over and hits the blue cylinder, that converges in, um, to the picture, you know, where you have no point labeled by six. On the other hand, if you just view that as a element of free abelian group on X minus Y, that sequence wouldn't converge. Definitely the topologies are different. So definitely, you know, you're definitely not allowed to just take U equals Y. So you do need some, some assumptions. Any questions or just like, I can say something again if I said something too fast. Did you say that in the second case, the uh, the sequence wouldn't converge if you were just letting your space be x yeah. minus y? Yeah, so in the second case, we're looking at free abelian group on this half open cylinder, right? So in the second case, the blue, in, in the first case, the blue is this region where points vanish if they enter it, is how I like to think about it. And then in the second case, the blue is just not included in our space. So, you know, okay. a sequence of points, or, you know, we have a sequence of configurations and the point labeled by six is moving to the left. Um, but just, you know, it doesn't, just wouldn't converge. Um, you know, because like, if you forget the other points, if you just think you have one point in a half open interval and that point moves to the open boundary, like that sequence doesn't converge. Paul, would you mind reminding me where the topologies of, of each of these two spaces uh, come from? Yeah, I mean, so, 
you know, I mean, it's it. Um, okay, yeah. So the topology, you have just a free abelian group on X, comes from the, the quotient topology on um, coming from a surjective map from like X n distant union of X to the n cross e to the n. Um, mm, right, right, yeah, yeah, I, I, you had that on a slide before. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so we can say, so, like, well, yeah. it's, it's fine, it's way at the... Yeah, it's way at the beginning. The beginning. Uh, and, you know, it was sort of a review yeah, of... Was, yeah, there yeah. it is. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so last time we sort of talked a, a little bit more about this, but, you know, what you should mm -hmm. think is, okay, points can move around in your space, mm -hmm. and... Um, they can basically they crash into each other and you add their labels. Yeah. Sort of the only weird thing that can happen. Um and you know, and be I guess the opposite can happen. Like uh, oh, I guess also, you know, if points are labeled by zero, they vanish. Um and so, you know, like what can happen? Well, two points can appear, one with labeled seven and the other with labeled and then they can sort of diverge. You know, you can have like a big bang you know, lots of points just appear out of nowhere as long as their sum is zero. Okay. In a yeah, so basically you just get this union uh, thing and then you mod out by those, like the relations that, that give the properties that you just described. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, Thanks. Yeah, and then this relative thing, um, you know, so if we just had free abelian group on the cylinder, then this point labeled by six would walk over and enter the blue region, and we just have a point labeled by six in the blue region. However, you know, here we're we're quotienting by, um, you know, okay, so the, the topology on Z of X modulo Z of Y is just, again, the quotient topology, because now you know the topology on Z of X, and that surjects onto the quotient. Um, but you should think of it as just points enter, can like walk over to the blue region, but then they vanish. Uh, and so, you know, how do you say rigorously? Well, you can walk over to the blue region and then we have a point, you know, here in the blue region labeled by six. But um, that picture and the picture below agree up to addition by an element in Z of Y. Mm -hmm. So then they're equivalent. So I could have written converges to and then had a black dot labeled by six here. Mm -hmm. That point yeah. is the same as no black dot labeled by six. Um, yeah, so in, yeah. So you know, in, in this picture, um, if we were just looking at the free abelian group on the cylinder minus its uh, boundary sphere, then the sequence wouldn't converge because I mean, there's you're not allowed to have a point in the blue region, like the blue region is just not in our space anymore. Whereas in Z of X modulo Z of Y, the blue region is in our space, but it's you know, like the Bermuda Triangle or something, like things just vanish if they enter it. Um, so you know, these things are definitely not homeomorphic. Like, if you if you look at the um configurations of points in the cylinder rel one side of the cylinder that space is contractible um because you could, i think it's you know you can shove it intuitively it's contractible because you just shove everything into the blue region on the other hand um you know if you the other space seem you know is probably not contractible okay any other uh questions on excision dot labeled by three has a smudge. Um, great. Okay, so the dimension axiom just says the um, what do we need to show? We need to show that the homotopy groups of the free abelian group on a point um, are z in degree zero and zero otherwise. Well, free abelian group on a point is just z. Now we're taking the homotopy groups of z viewed as a discrete space. And pi zero, you know, it's just the connected components, so that's z. 
And then each of the connected components are contractible, so the higher homotopy groups are trivial. So that's the dimension axiom. Um, oh yeah, product axiom. So we need to show that um, this functor takes, um, yeah, again, I wrote the proof, but I didn't write what we were trying to prove, which is so great. I guess what we're trying to prove, we're trying to show that, I'll just write the case where we have two things. I, I of Z of A disjoint union B. We're trying to prove that this is pi I of A. Plus pi I of B. Um, you know, except possibly with infinite products, but uh, yeah, so the way we, we check that is, um, yeah, just this fact that you take the free abelian group on disjoint union, that takes it to uh, the product of the um, disjoint unions, sorry, the product of the free abelian groups on each piece. Um, I want to or there's some like finiteness thing that's confusing me I probably don't want to say product um, probably I want to say subspace of the product where um where we have the, the, the like identity element, which is like the empty configuration in all but finitely many things. Um, yeah. And then um, if you take the homotopy group um, of a product, at least a finite product, it becomes a direct sum. I think I screwed up the finiteness conditions twice. It cancels. Um, yeah, so certainly, so like statement is Z of A is training union B is Z of A cross Z of B. Right, because if you know, um, uh, I'm not sure exactly what I can say, but you know, for you being group on A and B, you just look at the part in A, and you look at the part in B, what you get, and then um, it's an elementary exercise to see that um, homotopy groups of a uh, you know, high I. Oops, I deleted everything. Uh, you know, the, the homotopy groups take products to uh, direct sums. Um, yeah. Any questions? Okay. How much time is left? These classes go way too fast. People should slow me down. I don't want to make like. 35 slides for each day. Um, oh, yeah. So, okay. Um, and now, you know, Manuel, if you want to give long speeches, this is like a great time also. Um, you, uh, I don't have anything to say, I think. No, no, yeah. I don't think for the next part. Um, oh. Yeah. So, okay. this is more just like, a, you know, if you're interested or like why these Eilenberg Senior Rod ideas are historically important. Um, so if, if you have a bunch of, if you have some functors uh, that satisfy all of the uh, axioms except for the dimension axiom, 
It's called a, a generalized uh, homology theory. And um, so, you know, if the homology is uh, just concentrated in a single degree, um, and you pick some group that's, you know, not necessarily the integers, or you're, sorry, if you're, if your functor set evaluated on a point is just, you know, is concentrated in a single degree, uh, then you're just going to get a shift of ordinary homology, like possibly with coefficients. Um, but it won't be that interesting. But, you know, if um, the functor is non-zero in lots of degrees, you could get uh, something interesting. Um, and these are, you know, called uh, generalized homology theories, and there's a classification theorem for them, and I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about them. Um, oh, yeah, and so before the FIs were, you know, we're thinking are non-negative degrees because, like, homology is zero in negative degrees. Um, you know, I guess reduced homology can be non-zero in degree minus one. That's... Uh, Different issue. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so here we're allowing I to be potentially negative. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, I'm going to tell you what spectra are, and then that spectra classify generalized homology theories. So, if you have um, base spaces X and Y, the um, uh, oh yeah, maybe before we do this, if I'll just ask for questions again about things that um, are actually like more directly related to the rest of the course. Okay. Um, okay. So a um, yeah. So if you have uh, spaces X and Y, the um, that are base spaces, they're smash product. Is the product modulo the relation that um, base point in one space cross uh, any point, uh, like all points of the, that type is are collapsed. Um, so you should think of this as the natural product in the category of base spaces. Um, yeah, so it, here, um, if you if you smash two spheres together, you get a sphere. Um, okay, yeah. So, um, and if you if you take a space, a base space, and you smash it with a circle, you just get the um, suspension of the space. Um, you know, so all the. Um, if you look at the reduced homology of the smash product, you have a Kuna theorem to compare it with the reduced homology of X and Y. Um, you know, so it's isomorphic to the homology of X tensor the homology of Y if the homology of X or Y is free, or if you're using you know, using coefficients over a field, that assumption is always satisfied. Um, and you know, a special case of this. Sorry, could could you um, remind me what the suspension of space means? Oh yeah, so in pictures, you know, if we have a space X, then let's get a different color. Where are my colors? Uh, suspension is you, oops, you need, you add, um, you, you know, let's say you uh, cross your space with an interval, and then you collapse both ends of the interval now. Okay, yeah, yeah. I remember it now. Thanks. Yeah. So, you know, if you start out with like a circle, you're going to get a sphere. Um, Would it be terribly difficult in pictures to try to describe how that particular smash product ends up with that? I'm having trouble visualizing that. Oh yeah, and there, there's there's some confusing thing with. Okay, yeah, let's try to draw the. 
start over again. Okay. So this is X. Um, and we'll have the base point. Blue is X naught. Um, and then, yeah, we, we have S1. Um, okay, so we're going to view S1 as 0, 1 modulo like the set 0, 1. And, you know, I'll say S will be the base point in S naught, which is going to be like the equivalence class of 0, 1. Hopefully this is a good model. Okay, so we're going to take a product with S1. So first we'll just like take a product with the interval. Right, and then we get a cylinder. And now we need to figure out exactly what needs to be identified. Right, so like, do, do you agree that X smash S1 should be a quotient of X cross the interval? Is, yeah, that makes sense. S1 is a quotient of the interval and the smash product is a quotient of the product. And then now let's just, in purple, draw everything that gets collapsed to a point. Well, the tops and the, and the bottoms get collapsed. Let's see. Oh, yeah, get collapsed to a point. Uh, they, they, they would get collapsed to the point if we were just taking x Cross a circle, right? Um, oh, sorry. If we're taking x cross a circle, um, x cross a circle makes those two things equal to each other, but not equal to one point, right? Uh, you kind of curious. Oh yeah, cross a circle. Sorry. I, yes. Okay, I can undo this. Let's think. Okay, so one thing in the smash product. Um, this blue point, uh, this, this entire line gets smashed to a point, or gets identified to a point, because it's base point in X cross something. I always, uh, also, Manuel, if you see like what I'm doing wrong, tell me. Okay, okay. So now, what what happens to? Uh, oh, and you're saying that in the circle, the top and the bottom are identified to each other. Wait, in the circle. Oh, you're you're saying like this point is identified with this point. Right. You know, and this blue point is identified with this blue point, but the blue and the purple aren't yet equal. Yeah, is that right? I agree with the picture so far, yes. Yes. OK. Um, and. Wait, okay. Now I'm confused. Um, should we draw a torus? Would that be better? I'm always like hesitant to try to draw a torus. Uh, or, or also, Manuel, do you think my statement, statement we're trying to prove is true? Or do you think I screwed up base points? Like, do I need to put a disjoint base point on X? I'm pretty sure this is true. You just, your picture could be drawn a little bit prettier. Uh, Can I draw this? Yeah, okay, so, so. Let's see. 
Uh, oh, yeah, I can approve. Yeah, so right. Here's your circle, right? Oh, so now you, you can people see what you're drawing? I can, uh, or maybe you've not drawn anything yet. Okay, I'm trying to draw a line. It's not letting me. Yeah. Also, if you want, you can just, like open Microsoft Paint and share your screen or share that with us. So right, here's our circle and here's our point. So let's also just make this the base point of our circle. So doing that, uh, let's see, base point of our circle, well, that should collapse this point and this line to the same thing. So in the end, right, we've got this thing over here, attach it down to here, collapsing this, right? So this gives you a copy of like, what, uh, you copy of your space X, and you've kind of pinched it together now like this. And right, you've really identified this point and this point together. So it looks like you've suspended it, but you've now just merely identified this line and this line. So you can pull those apart to get your suspension in general. This wasn't the greatest explanation, but I'm pretty sure your statement's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and the, 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 the torus, it's easier to show because, okay, so. Yeah, why don't we just, should we just erase everything? Yeah. I'm gonna, okay, annotate it. Again. Hopefully you can draw. So we've got an S1 cross S1. We've got a torus. So yeah, what do we do first? Uh, I'll make this blue. So right, we identify this thing here. Uh, we can identify with itself, so completely collapse it. Yeah. So that's just a ball with a point, like crushed in the middle. Is it like, if you think about a torus like this, are we just collapsing the boundary to a point? Yes. And which gets a two sphere. Yeah. Okay. And so like, I guess what I'm trying to say in my, my version of the picture, right, we've got this circle, we've now like have this infinitesimally small point, like this point here that comes from collapsing this, then we collapse this other circle in the torus here. So now we just have a ball that's just kind of like touching itself on the edge, like this. And this is supposed to be a two sphere, but yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll explain it in the case that X is a circle. Yeah. And I am bad at visualizing, but it seems to be true. Yeah. Okay, so when X is a circle, we want to get S2. You know, we want S1 smash S1 to be S2 because that's the suspension of S1. Um, so S1 cross S1 is, um, is a torus, which I'm thinking of as this identification surface here. And then um, the boundary of the torus is exactly the, um, the points that get collapsed when you map the product down to the, um, to the smash. And if you take a square and, mo and collapse the entire boundary, you get a two sphere. Um, yeah. There is probably like a, there is probably a better explanation of this, but it seems to be true. Any other questions or people wanting to suggest better ways of seeing the statement? I think this version with the these two pictures for the Taurus was um, quite clear. Yeah, I definitely see it in the uh, S1 smash S1 case. I don't fully see how that generalizes, but it makes yeah, sense. I'm trying. slightly confused and um, also, um, okay, but it's good. It's also easy to mess up statements because like, it's easy to remember a statement in spaces versus and think it's in base spaces or vice versa. So if I tell you something false, it is pro you know, probably about base points. 
Um, okay. Yeah. So, you know, this is a reasonable definition to, to be aware of. You know, so this is just like the most convenient product in the case of um, base spaces. So, what's a, a spectrum? Um, so, the, the, the idea of spectra is we're taking the category of spaces and we're trying to formally invert the suspension operation. Um, so what a spectrum is, is it's a sequence of spaces and a, um, and a, a choice of map from the uh, nth space, from the suspension of the nth space to the n plus first space. Uh, and so if you have a space, you can get a spectrum called the suspension spectrum denoted suspension infinity of x. And what it is is just um, the uh, sequence uh, where the nth space is the n, n fold suspension of your space. And, you know, the, the maps are the, you know, uh, you know, the suspension of the, you know, what are the, uh, so, you know, here, space is x, suspension x. Suspension of suspension of X, et cetera, and what dot dot dot. And what's the data of maps? Well, we need a map from suspension of suspension of X to well, suspension of suspension of X. You just take the you know canonical, you know, you take the identity map. Um so you know, so we have this category, and each each space gives us a category or gives us an object of this. Um I guess I won't tell you what morphisms are. Um, but, um, you, know, uh, you know, each space gives you a spectrum. Um, and you can take... So, quick question. Oh, yeah. So, is the right way to think of a spectrum like a resolution, or...? Uh, uh, oh, be... Like the suspension spectrum is some sort of like canonical resolution. Um, I think you should think of it as like localizing, like you're trying to invert sigma. Like what you should think of is if you have a space. I okay, so I am not thinking clearly, so I don't. I'm not saying 100% that I know what you're saying is like not the right way of thinking about it. But I don't know that it is the right way of thinking about it. But what you should think is like normally, you know, if you have a space X, you can send it to, um, you know, suspension of X. But there's no way. There's no desuspension functor, and there are plenty of spaces that aren't. Um, there are plenty of spaces that are not the suspension of some other space. But in, in spectra, you could sort of desuspend a spectrum just by shifting. So like if, if some spectrum X is the sequence X0, X1. Oh yeah, so one thing in, in a resolution, well, in a resolution, you, you usually have maps. Um, from one to the next. Um, I don't know. And he, whereas here you're suspending, but I guess like in algebra, you often think of suspension as just like a grading shift, which maybe you have in resolution. I, I'm confused, but um, yeah. So I, th I think it's it's um, different. Um, yeah. Yeah. Like resolutions um, are usually like constructions that um, make something uh, free or something like that, right? With certain properties, but still equivalent yeah. to what you started with, weekly equivalent. Um, that's kind of not the spirit here. Yeah. The spirit is exactly what Jeremy said. You want to invert this shift functor to obtain like a, a category of objects where you can de-suspend. Um, oh yeah, and then I'm bad at indexing. What do I? Oh, I just I want to shift things to the right. 
that what I want to do? I just want to put like maybe a, what I want to do. I want to say point, or do I want to shift things the other way? What's the D suspension? Um, I think it is this way, but I it can't get like left and rights correct without um, um, at the board. Um, or you could shift the other way. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's, it's some category where every object is suspension of some other object. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so the suspension spectrum is a example of a spectrum and you can, you can take, um, uh, each, each spectrum gives you a homology theory as follows. You can, um, you, if, if Y is a space and X is a spectrum, you can define, um, a, you know, an abelian group, X, I evaluated on Y as the, you take the, um, I plus nth homotopy group of XN smash Y, and then you send N to infinity. And, um, it turns out that like this construction, if you have a spectrum, gives you a generalized homology theory. And when you have the right equivalence notion on spectra, then um, spectra are homotopy equivalent, like if and only if they give you the same generalized cohomology theory. Um, yeah, and I didn't say like what the maps are in this co-limit, but um, if you sort of think about you know, homotopy groups or maps out of spheres uh, and suspensions have to do with spheres, you end up getting natural maps. Um, okay, yeah, so the, the, the last thing I wanted to say is that, um, you know, there's a, a, so ordinary homology is a um, generalized homology theory. So what spectrum um, corresponds to that? So I need to give you for each um, for each n, a um, each n a space and a map from the nth space to the n plus first space. So H z is going to be um, the it's a spectrum. So the nth space is going to be the free abelian group on the interval to the n module of the boundary of the interval. Um, and okay, so now I need a map from the suspension of the nth space to the n plus first space. So, you know, in, in pictures, what do I need, or what do I need to do? I need to um, give you a map from an interval cross a uh, free abelian group on interval to the n modulo boundary to, um, you know, free abelian group on interval to the n plus one modulo boundary. Um, so what you should do is you should, in this picture, you should think of uh, the interval this interval parameter as where this line is. Or I don't know, I guess you could say, okay, so what do we need to do? We need to take uh, configurations of points in an interval and a point in the interval and get a configuration of points in the square. So what you do is you take your configure, you put your interval into the square using your, using the point T, but T will be at the X coordinate. If we're thinking of the interval as, um, like on the uh, y axis. Um, and so that gives you a map from the product. And then you need to check that it gives you a map that uh, it, it factors through the, uh, the smash. And that corresponds to, well, if t is 0 or t is 1, um, this should go to the base point. And it does because when t is 0, uh, all these points are in the, on the the left endpoint of the square, and when t is 1, all the points are in the right endpoint of the square. And then the, um, the theorem is that the generalized homology theory associated to this spectrum is just ordinary homology. Um, so, you know, this is an example of a spectrum that isn't just you take some space and you keep suspending it. Um, yeah, so I... 
went kind of fast, but I'm happy to talk about anything. I'm also happy for people to say I checked out for the last 15 minutes. Um, because, you know, this is sort of a digression. Um, it's just... Any questions? Yeah, could you go back to the previous slide, please? Sure. All right, so here... Um, I'm just trying to uh, get a picture in my head of the of the co-limit thing. How that definition works. Yeah, so maybe it's interesting if you plug in... Let's plug in Y. Annotate. Um, you plug in, um, plug in like X is the suspension spectrum of S0. That means like XN is SN. Um, and let's plug in Y is S0. What are you going to get? Um, so then, I don't know, XN smash Y is SN. So then, um, so we, you'd get pi I plus N of SN. And then there's a theorem that for i sufficiently large compared to n, uh, this doesn't depend on n. So like the, when y is S0 and x is the suspension spectrum of S0, you get uh, the, the stable homotopy groups of spheres. As and and what do we get precisely there? Like in this so case? This, oh, this this thing is not known in general. So like when i is one, when i is zero, it's you get z. When i is one, you get z mod two. Uh, is the next one z mod two? Anyone know? I have... yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I think so. I'm like 90% sure. I know how to, uh, I'm not, I'm not. but these things are only calculated out to about I equals 60. There's like some, there's somewhat calculated. And that's recent, recent work, right? What? Yeah. Is that recent work? <laughs> it's recent work yeah. going from like about 60 to like most of the groups up to 90 with like some gaps. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, Hoff figured out I equals one. And then like Sayer figured out the next eight and got a Fields medal. Like he got a Fields medal, not for algebraic geometry, but he got it for or number theory, but he got it for algebraic topology. Then like, um, I think like Hoda and maybe those people like got the next, you know, got out to like 15 and then Peter, or maybe Peter May, like, with his May spectral sequence, like, helped people get out to, like, 15 or 20 and got tenure at Chicago. And then, you know, Mark Mahalwald and his crew got it, like, up to, like, around 60. And then now recent um, recent work um, has, like, expanded it. But it's sort of, you know, it's a major... You, you can't just, like, plug it into a computer and there is no, you know... There's no obvious pattern. Okay, and these yeah. numbers are for a big N. But yeah, it's for a big N. So, like, these groups, you take the co-limit. Um, mm -hmm. So, I think, like, pi 3 of S2 is Z. Um, on the other hand, like, once you get... Right, pi... I plus one of S I is um, 
I'm screw switching I and N or whatever. Is Z mod two once um once N is or I greater or equal three. I guess the I should be N's. Okay. Okay, okay. Um yeah, and I guess like uh pi two of S one is zero. So you, you get some no you know. Um, so like eventually they're constant, but computing the the stable value is um, yeah is a major challenge. I know. So in this course we'll talk about like I'll draw a picture of why pi three s two is z and why it becomes um, z mod two in higher dimensions. Like there's a picture involving configuration spaces and unwinding loops. Uh, but the, the higher ones, I don't have a good understanding of. And to some extent, society does not have a, I mean, society has a huge, but very incomplete understanding of higher ones. So, you know, in general, these things are very hard to, to compute. Are there other questions? I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>